us started. So uh, once again, I, I entered us in the, the main session, but my name is Steve Bravo. I'm the technical solutions director from Black Teal. Uh, but before I jump too much into the intro, um, so this discussion, um, to give you the background, so uh, Matt Towery and Thomas Ebel, Matt from Energy Bridge Consulting and Matt from uh, Leeward Renewable Energy, we all got together and took on the topic of battery degradation, uh, when you should consider augmentation and augmentation techniques and wrote it down into a white paper. And our session is going to be kind of very summary discussion of that white paper. Um, and then we'll put a link to the paper in the um, in the chat and so that you guys can uh, see that as you go forward. So let me kick off things by just a further intro of myself. So um, once again, I'm Steve Bravo, uh, Technical Solutions Director for Black Teal. I've been in the overall the clean energy industry for about 11 years, about five of those years have been specifically in energy storage. And on the white paper, I specifically tackled and I'll discuss today, um, the, se the section called augmentation and degradation management techniques, which will be uh, where we'll go through the different, like in the predominant techniques that we've seen for best augmentation in the market at this point. Matt, pass it over to you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, Matt Towery here, uh, Managing Partner of Energy Bridge Consulting, which I started uh, summer of last year. Um, but prior to that, I was working both on the developer side um, and independent engineering services side for um, a lot of M&A for battery storage. Um, but yeah, prior to that, I was in nuclear and thermal. So I kind of made my way across the energy transition, if you want to call it that. So, Thomas. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Thomas Ebel, I... I'm working for Leeward Renewable Energy. I'm leading the best engineering uh, department and I've been with them for about a year. Prior to Leeward, I worked for another uh, IPP. Uh, just for people who are not familiar with all those acronyms, uh, it stands for Independent Power Producer. This essentially uh, entities that would build, own, and operate um, renewable assets and then sell the electrons to utility, for example. Um, so prior to Leeward, I was with Clear Energy Group for about three years. And before this, I was on the other side of the of the fence, uh, as I like to say it, uh, working for OEM, so integrators and battery manufacturers. So overall, uh, a little bit over 10 years in the battery world, um, all sorts of batteries at first. I used to work in Asia for about five years, but everything that's utility scales, uh, you're closing into the 10 years, so really most of my career. Nice to meet you all. So uh, I, I keep the floor here just for the first couple of slides. Um, as, as Steve mentioned, you know, during the main session uh, about the white paper that's been released. Uh, and I, again, I encourage everyone here, I think on the main session in the chat, uh, somebody posted the link. Uh, maybe, maybe we can do it on, on here as well. Um, we just wanted to tackle that best degradation and more specifically augmentation because it's something that's known across the industry that it is a need um, and a lot, you know, every one of us has an opinion about it, but uh, really nobody uh, took the time to, to put it down in writing, so to speak. So really um, quickly going back to what Steve mentioned uh, during the presentation, that, that white paper covers uh, why uh, do we need to augment a, a battery uh, system? So essentially, you know, why, what's, what's behind the degradation of it? Uh, why do you might, uh, might want to consider augmentation? In some instances, you might you know, not need to. Um, an overview of some of the um, common techniques um, currently in the industry. It's some of them are theoretical, you know, just giving a disclaimer here. Um, obviously, we are lacking a lot of return on experience as it is quite new. Um, deployments are getting bigger and bigger. And that best augmentation is going to become a critical need very, very uh, soon. Um, it's not meant to be a very deep uh, chemistry topic here, because I've noticed that during this forum here, there's a lot of chemists uh, happy to chat about this, but maybe, you know, further, further, you know, throughout the breakout sessions. Um, but yeah, and just in general, like looking forward to discussing these topics with you guys. All right, so degradation fundamentals. Uh, this might be one of the most iconic uh, graph that you've seen, uh, you know, around. We're focusing on LFP just because it's been the Dom, you know, dominant chemistry currently for utility scale projects. Again, very, very focused on utility scale, the whole world of, of IPP, as I mentioned earlier. So LFP has been predominant. Uh, prior to this, it was mostly NMC, but essentially here is just showing sort of uh, 
how a battery degrades depending on, on the, your cycling life. So how many cycles per day, per month, per year, your calendar life, which means uh, the spend kind of the useful uh, lifetime, you know, design life. The DOD impact means uh, depth of discharge. So you're cycling your battery, yes, but how do you cycle it? So do you do a full discharge, full charge? Do you do small discharge at a time and, until you empty or do you, or even just, you know, up and down like throughout the day? So it's, it's very various applications. Um, and then the white paper just has a couple of notes, as I mentioned prior to LFP, there was NMC. So just quick notes on the different uh, lithium ion chemistries out there. All right, so this one uh, is very specific to our industry. Um, as I mentioned, building those big uh, battery projects for utilities. Uh, this is something that was kind of close to my heart. It's, it's related to uh, a project execution. Hence, um, you know, so it might be very specific. Not everybody might be uh, involved in, the, in this kind of topics, but essentially what is meant here by the start of the clock is um, at the very early stage in a factory, you build your battery. And that's, um, and so there's different processes. And like I said here, it sounds in this forum, there's plenty of folks extremely knowledgeable about this. Um, one of this process that really starts to clock off a battery degradation is called battery formation. And um, so, you know, whoever, depending on who's your, no, actually, sorry, regardless of who's your equipment provider, there's going to be that kind of clock that starts ticking from that moment. So whether it's an integrator, you buy it directly from a battery manufacturer, you know, regardless, that's the start of the clock. And then, um, so you try to, to procure, to secure this capacity. And then on the other side of the table, you have your off-taker, which uh, would be a utility, for example, could be a community choice aggregator, et cetera. And so with them, you have certain obligation as to how much, uh, how many megawatt hours you will be delivering throughout, you know, certain, a certain term. So 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, every day, you know, et cetera. So there's a lot of parameters. And uh, what I wanted to emphasize here with uh, the red arrow here, you are here, is that you have to kind of juggle with, with both concepts because you're buying an equipment that's, uh, that's degrading, you know, day by day. And at the same time, you have to guarantee your, a, a minimum performance to your customer. And so there's a little gap here. And um, I really wanted to focus on, on this section in the white paper to kind of raise awareness. I think it's important for people like me in the industry, um, uh, since, since we own and operate, you know, to be, to be aware of that, to be cognizant. When you design a project, think about when you actually starts deliver start delivering to your to your off taker so it was a bit lengthy here but i think it was just for context since i've noticed you know we have people from various industries is uh back to yep. matt yep. yeah thanks thomas uh yeah so before we jump into why you should consider augmentation for both the economic standpoint and just engineering standpoint um just a level set on the definition of augmentation at addition of new battery capacity, no megawatt hours and energy um, to compensate for degradation and maintain the project's performance over its lifetime. And I would say not only is performance, but it's also your revenue stream when you're going to get tax equity financing and what you're promising investors that your project is going to deliver. So next slide. Um, this pie chart on the right is a pretty infamous, if you haven't seen it before, from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, I reference this quite a bit when um, training new developers, new engineers. So early as your origination commercial team is, you know, trying to figure out where do we want to deploy battery, right? Whether it's in Kaiso, ERCA, PJM, um, and the wholesale markets, defining that use case or the multiple use cases, you know, I think we're all familiar with the, the surge and merchant, uh, battery projects in ERCA where you have spin, non -spin, spin reserve, arbitrage, frequency regulation, all these pieces of that use case have different, um, as Thomas mentioned, depths of discharge, right? Your frequency re regulation is going to be a very different battery dispatch model than energy arbitrage or some of the other um, use cases such as resource adequacy, which is more common in KISO. So I kind of encourage, kind of talking through the white paper, defining that very early on and getting, understanding your economics, both from a battery sizing, augmentation, revenue standpoint, will really help you as you go through the project life cycle, 
you know, through investment committee, tax equity financing, that you're not deflating some of the things you may have forgotten to put in your model early on. And a lot of that will kind of focus on augmentation reserves um, and things like that. The other, the other piece we do talk about in the white paper is, as I mentioned, ERCOT, very big merchant market right now. Um, there's also other merchant markets in the U.S. But how does that differ between when you have a fixed tolling or a PPA agreement, or maybe your def- your things as cycles and energy at the POI or the point of interconnect are more defined than something like a merchant forecast, for example. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so the second piece, other than once you kind of figure out your augmentation schedule, um, your initial overbuild, you kind of have an idea of how many times you want to augment over the years to maintain your um, energy at the POI. The biggest piece that I've often seen both on the developer and the finance side, uh, having been a developer myself, is what are the co- what are these future costs of batteries, right? Um, as you guys know, in the past two years, the snapshot from the lithium carbonate index, it's the price of lithium has dropped dramatically. Um, a lot of various reasons, I think, that influence that um, overseas and with kind of deployment of the domestic content to compete with overseas batteries, but um, using, I think from a developer standpoint, using third-party projections such as Bloomberg, there's plenty of other companies out there is great. Um, I think as a developer and financer, you need to kind of have your own baseline assumption of what you're consuming and battery costs in the the future. Um, With this dramatic drop in the past few years, assuming an eight to 10% decrease through year 15 of your project, maybe a little aggressive. Um, So I'd encourage you to develop kind of that P50, P80 view and see how that impacts your economics on your project. Uh, The other piece too that I often see forgotten is just because you have the price of the battery pack, you still need someone to install it, um, someone to do the uh, EMS integration support services, you know, kind of depending on what type of augmentation approach you take as as Steve will cover in the next couple slides. Um, And then lastly too, tying back that merchant versus kind of firm offtake you know, in reality, if you're forecasting you're going to cycle 100 cycles a year in merchant market, you don't really know if that's actually going to happen, right? You may go above that, below that. So kind of determining that exact year you plan to augment, knowing that you're taking a kind of a deflationary view on battery, um, battery cost, it could be a little aggressive. So I, I was encouraged to look at different ways to show, um, you know, an OPEX reserve for augmentation over the course of 20 25 years for your asset, um, as it can definitely swing the IRR on a project like that early on. So, um, yeah, up to you, Steve. All right, thanks, Matt. Okay, so in the last section here, I'll cover the different augmentation options that we saw, that we covered in the white paper at a pretty high level. Um, We covered this more in depth in the white paper, just with the interest of time, I'm gonna cover them. And then if we get into the question and answer, if if people have any more, I can cover them in a little bit more in depth. So at this point, you know, we, as I'm covering this, you've decided to augment your project. So as, you know, Thomas covered, hey, there's degradation. This might drive you to need to augment. Matt said, hey, you know, you should consider augmentation based off your project. I'm at the point where you're going to say you're going to augment. So what are your options to do that? So working from the top left, so the six ways that we looked at this was the first one is direct module replacement. And as the diagram shows, essentially that's evaluating and analyzing the degradation profile, where is the state of those of the various modules in a project and deciding and just going back and directly replacing those. In the diagram, you replace all of them, but in, in reality, how many you replace and what you do is kind of at the discretion of the project and is kind of based off the economics, the requirements, a lot of different things factor into how, how many you would replace and what you would do. The second one is DC direct. And so this is where you have based because you have deg- um, you have degradation in the existing uh, system, you created a little bit of a headspace in your DC bus or perhaps you built it in at the beginning, and that is simply adding new enclosures onto your DC bus to add that capacity which um, that we defined earlier on the augmentation side. The third one, moving kind of on the top row to the right, uh, centralized DC to DC. So 
uh, this is very similar to DC Direct, but the difference here is, is that when you do DC Direct, you do not control or mitigate any of the degradation. So as you've added those new systems in DC Direct, you're still kind of at the mercy of the degradation or the voltage of those existing systems. By adding a centralized DC to DC, you're actually controlling that. So you get better, you're getting essentially a greater efficiency or more use out of that new system. You're using it at an optimum level, and but just requires you to have that DC to DC solution in order to do that in between the new enclosures. Moving down to the bottom left, uh, DC, DC shuffling is a pretty involved one. It's similar in the sense that you're gonna evaluate the different degradation states uh, across your project. And in this case, what you do is once you've evaluated that, you're actually gonna move entire enclosures to kind of reorient or shuffle your system such that those that are degraded are connected in, in a way that they, they max out the existing kind of um, main voltage transfer, uh, medium voltage transformer, excuse me, and the PCS, uh, allowing you to create additional headspace where you can add new enclosures that have a higher capability. The next one, as we move away from kind of DC, we get into the two variations that we looked at on the AC side. One is AC medium voltage. And this is essentially adding entire kind of lines of uh, medium voltage transformer, PCS and enclosures. And then finally on the bottom right is we're using uh, an AC or where you have an embedded string inverter inside the enclosure. It's using AC inverters to uh, essentially in a similar function as DC direct but because you have that AC enclosure, it allows you to add it and control the, um, it allows you to mitigate and control the degradation between the new and existing systems. So like I said, these are the six that we looked at in the paper. We go in, in the paper, we go into a little bit more about what you'll need. There's a, we, we, we look at it, what you need to do it, and a little bit more of a discussion about the pros and cons of each. So going on to kind of the last slide of the presentation here, in the summary portion of the paper, I just essentially directly copied this table, and and I and I'll preference this by saying this was a table and a summary of conclusions that Matt and Thomas and I came to after discussing not only amongst ourselves but discussions with other industry people that we know about. Hey, these six different augmentation techniques. This is but. This is kind of our general take between a cost estimate, impact on your LGIA, increases to your footprint and such on and so forth. Now, one another disclaimer I'd say is just because you see more green doesn't mean that that's the, the one that we're recommending. There is no recommendations that we'd make because everything is a little project specific and there's pros and cons to each. So, you know, direct module replacement, although it has three greens in certain cases, there, it, that's one where you, if you, if cost is more important, it's something you need to balance out with the others. So as you go through this, the other, uh, as you go through this, you'll see various ones have kind of yellow, red, green, but those are just various areas of these mixtures that we said, this one would be a pro, this one would be a con and something to consider as you look and say, what are the needs of my project? What are the PPAs? What are, um, do I have the ability to add footprints? Do I have the ability to add a main voltage transformer and PCS things to consider. The other thing is on the notes at the very bottom, specifically for DC direct and for AC uh, low voltage, there's, there's a certain way of like, as people have gone through with augmentation, one of the things that we've discovered is that there's a lot of projects throughout the history that have been installed and some of them didn't have planning for augmentation built in when they first built the project. But as you go forward, as you look at certain one of these cases, planning ahead can have a, a positive impact on the cost estimate for things like DC Direct and ACLV. So with that, um, that is the end of our kind of, uh, okay, excuse me, one last one. Um, just to kind of review what we went through. So Thomas talked about, hey, batteries degrade. Doesn't matter your chemistry, they will degrade. And they degrade at different levels, but there's some things that you should consider. What Matt talked about was the fact that, you know, in certain cases, you're gonna to wanna to consider augmentation, but in other cases, you might not want to, or you might not need to, because of the, the economics of your project, the setup of your PPA, 
there might be instances where you don't augment at all or where you choose because you think that battery prices are going to are going to stay relatively the same. Maybe you overbuild at the beginning. So the whole plan there and the whole intent of going through those things. And then to my section where we talked about the different augmentation techniques is there's just a lot to consider when it comes to augmentation. And our intent was to kind of write down some of those assumptions, some of those questions so that when, if you're a financier, if you're a project developer, if you're an OEM, that you're asking these questions so that you can, can kind of consider this, or at least you know what questions to ask as you consider augmentation and degradation on your project. And so then the last thing at the very bottom is the disclaimer. So once again, these were this research and this work we put together uh, are the opinions of uh, myself, Matt and Thomas, and they kind of reflect the, the, the opinions that we have in here. We're not making any recommendations of what you should do for your project, because overall, everything kind of depends on what you should pick based off the specifics of your project or ones that you consider. So with that, um, we'll open it up to questions. And